Okay, so let's go to the second uh, address in this session, Andrea Jaime, who doesn't need introduction. And Andrea will explain us how to do web mapping without Mercator. That's awesome. Hello, good morning, everybody. My name is Andrea Jaime. I'm going to talk about uh, mapping beyond web mer Mercator. I work for GeoSolutions, an Italian-based company that uh, uh, supports and develops uh, GeoServer, GeoTools, GeoNetwork, GeoNode, and a few others. Um, the topic of uh, today's presentation is, well, let's say, my frustration with seeing Web Mercator everywhere. So why do people use Web Mercator? Well, because there's plenty of free and ready-to-use tiles out there, OSM, Google Maps, uh, Bing Maps, whatever, open map tiles, they are all in Web Mercator. So you just have to go, cherry pick, ready. You have your own. Closer? Yeah, okay. Uh, you have your own uh, base map ready to go, and you just have to think about your overlays. So why bother about other projections when you can have this for free? Uh, why? Because it's familiar. I think it's a tragedy that people are used to look at the world like this, but uh, that's, how, that's how it is these days. And why? Because it's easy. Uh, learning about projection is not exactly the easiest thing uh, of the world. And uh, well, I think that from Louis's presentation and the next presentation and my presentation, this will become uh, very evident. Uh, so why have, make the effort to learn uh, several of them when you can get away with just one? Uh, there's one merit to the web mercator. It's fair to the dateline. It uh, turns the world into a continuous map. Okay, so you can just put two of the maps side by side and you get a continuous mapping across the Pacific, which is kind of nice and I think that people living in New Zealand appreciate that. Some reasons to avoid the web mercator, why you should stay away from it. One reason to rule them all, the reason that Lewis was talking about, distortion. Every map projection in induces some distortion because we are going from a double curvature surface, which is the Earth, to a flat surface. So we want to minimize a certain type of distortion in a certain area, and that's the, two, the, the, the job of each map projection. Um, so what is the distortion of Web Mercator? Well, Web Mercator distorts areas in a very significant way. So let's say that we took Italy, where I live, and we moved it uh, 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 atop Greenland. Italy would be suddenly become so much bigger, we probably wouldn't like the climate there, but... So, yeah, and uh, just a, another example, we, we keep on looking at UK that way. Well, UK is actually three times smaller than, than, than we see it in the web mercator. And, I mean, this problem becomes bigger and bigger as you move uh, far north. So, equal area maps to the rescue. Uh, what is the problem? Well, Luis was providing us a perspective about computation times and storage, but there is also a, a problem of perception. Uh, yes, you can use tools to measure areas, to measure distances on, on a map. You cannot turn off your eyes, and your eyes perceive relative proportions naturally. So, you, you cannot just stop your brain from doing that. So you can, you can look at the map and say, oh, this is two times bigger than that. If interpreting the map is based on such reasoning, people will do it whether you like it or not. So you need, in that case, an equal area projection. Uh, so all kinds of statistical maps uh, need this kind of projection. This is, a, this is an example for, from FAO. Um, and then there is another problem, which is the distance perception. Again, um, the web mercator uh, distorts distances in a very significant way. Again, if your map and, and the reading of your map is somehow related to comparing relative distances, you cannot stop your brain from saying, ah, that is two times longer than this. And then you have it very wrong if you are using Web Mercator. These are um, lines of equal distance at 300 and 200 kilometers from Maribor, Slovenia, 
they are not circles, as you can see, they are more like eggs. So, as you can see, the distances far north are exaggerated a lot. So what do you do? You can use an equidistant map instead. An equidistant map, uh, uh, like the azimuthal equidistant, for example, makes all distances equal to a center point. So if you have a use case in which you have a, a focal point in your map, and you wanted to make it very easy to perceive the relative distances from that point, then you use a, an equidistant map. And well, you've probably seen it around like in the UN logo, for example. Uh, another case here is uh, weather radar maps. So we have uh, weather stations and we wanted to map uh, the area around the weather station. Distances from the weather station are kind of important in this kind of interpretation. So that's why uh, the Canadian Weather Service uses uh, this kind of projection. Another problem with uh, uh, Web Mercator is that it, doesn't ne it never includes the pole. Sometimes it's, it includes Antarctica, sometimes it's so bad looking that people just scrap it away. <laughs> Let's forget about it. Um, and well, the poles are kind of important in this age and time. Uh, anyone worried about climate uh, changes and stuff like that? Well, the poles are where the action is. So for that, if you are particularly interested in, uh, in the poles, there are the uh, polar stereographic projections. This is one example from the northern pole and uh, another. Uh, they are, well, at least the second is geoserver powered. Uh, another one from uh, FAO, the species distribution, and uh, that's a south polar instead. And then, well, why do you not use Web Mercator because the law tell you otherwise. And there are lots, lots of laws telling you that you should be using something else. I don't think there is any law anywhere telling you to use Web Mercator. It's just a sort of the de facto standard for web developers. But if you are here in Romania, I asked uh, Kodrina to give me a list of common coordinate reference systems for uh, map publishing in, uh, in Romania, and she came up with this list. Web Mercator is one of them, but you typically have to support others for Inspire compatibility and to support the uh, local uh, way of viewing Romania, okay? So, long story short, uh, there are lots of reasons to stay away from Web Mercator. And then there are also the autocodes in WMS. Autocodes are a way to specify a generic CRS, like uh, a Mercator, for example, and provide the um, central axis of it on the fly. And I, uh, we have a number of customers doing, uh, doing that because they want to center the, the projection on the viewing area continuously to get the, the minimum distortion possible. OK, how do you handle all, the, all these projections? Okay, uh, well, uh, theoretically it should be simple. Luis already showed us that it, it, it isn't. Uh, in theory, one should just take each point or each pixels and reproject it to the target projection, and well, it's done. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, Luis already showed, that, showed us an example. Much can, uh, can actually go wrong, especially if you are a global data set and you wanted to reproject it to a local projection, which is something that we do a lot with our customers. So, this is one example of taking uh, a world map with all the countries in uh, latitude, longitude, and reprojecting it fully to UTM32 North. And this is the result that you get. <laughs> that, that thing draping uh, over uh, Europe is uh, uh, Russia, which is a huge polygon that goes way beyond the limits of UTM32 North uh, valid uh, area. And uh, well, the math starts wrapping around and you get that mess. And the other problem that uh, typically uh, we are dealing with and we are going to talk about is the dateline. It's like the world ends there and most of the software cannot handle it. So what's going on? We have global data sets versus locally defined projections. We have data crossing the date lines. We have a very long lines and so on. Do we have to pre-process our data to uh, you know, handle these issues, well, if you are just targeting one projection, you can pre-process your data, but what if you are 
uh, targeting 100 or infinite if you are using autocodes. You cannot just do it. The software has to do it for you on the fly. So in GeoServer, we have this advanced projection handling subsystem that does um, a bunch of these things and has a set of heuristics projection by projection to handle the common hiccups. So step one uh, in APH is decided with deciding which data to read, which sometimes is not obvious because if, I, uh, if I'm displaying something across the date line, I might have to pick data from the two ends of the latitude longitude grid. So GeoServer takes one bounding box that you provide and typically generates two to read from in your original data. Then you have to cut excess data. So you have to cut polygons, you have to cut lines so they don't go beyond the area of definition of the projection. I'm not talking about the legal area of definition. I'm talking about where the math is still so somewhat stable. So for a UTM, for example, it would be 45 degrees from the central meridian. After that, it starts going haywire. Then you might have to wrap data. If I'm mapping across the date line, I might have to replicate data that was on the other side of the, on the, the date line on this side so that I can get a continuous map. And then I, um, I might have to do dynamic densification. So if you're a project just point by point and you have very long lines in the input, you will get very long straight lines in the output. But the desired output is a curve instead. So what GeoServer does is to determine how much deformation there is, and then it starts adding points in, in the middle. It doesn't generate a generic curve. It's still all straight lines, but we have so many that you perceive a continuous curve. And then we are a project, and uh, during reprojection, some date line crossing might occur. This is a, just a datum shift, but some points that were touching the date line go right on the other side. So we have to deal with that. So there is a heuristic that detects date line crossing and unwraps it so that we get a nice map. So let's see some side-by-side -side examples of uh, what happens with and without APH because you can enable and disable it in GeoServer. So PDC Mercator, it's a Mercator centered on the Pacific so it's centered more or less on the date line. Actually, the center is 150 degrees um, east. So if I don't do anything, Antarctica goes away, uh, Greenland uh, goes bizarre, <laughs> and, and uh, I don't have a continuous map. With APH, everything looks like it should. Um, if I try to reproject in a lumbar conformal conic, which is an interrupted um, projection, I get Russia and part of uh, that, that area that oh, again goes bizarre in a similar way to what uh, Luis was showing us. GeoServer de determines that we are going beyond the area of definition, cuts the data, and voila, we get the result that we want. A uh, silly datum change. Let's say we go from um, uh, 4326 to 4230. It's just a different ellipsoid. Stuff keeps going on the other side of the date line. Kaboom, we get long lines everywhere. Antarctica has that bizarre thing at the bottom. With APH, we detected the date line crossing and fixed them. And this is the 32 North case, the super bizarre thing. And then the data cut uh, in the area of validity and properly displayed. Uh, Let's say I just want to center on the Pacific. Well, uh, if I don't uh, do anything, I get only half of the map that I wanted. I have to replicate the rest of the data on the other side of the date line, which APH does. There are some other hard data cases to handle, like many meteorological data are not delivered in between minus 180 and 180, but between 0 and 360. And I'm like, what? <laughs> So we had to teach the software that uh, uh, there are these cases and to do multiple reads and stitch the stuff together again in the map. And then there are satellites and satellites and more satellites. Sentinel-2, Sentinel-3, Sentinel-whatever, uh, Sentinel-N. They keep on mapping the planet, they keep on um, taking photos, and for some reason they decided to keep 
taking photos even across the date line. I mean, the world ends there. You shouldn't be taking a, a snapshot there in the middle of a, a discontinuity. But they do, because the planet is actually continuous there. So they, they then give you the data in UTM-60 or UTM-1 with the actual pixels going across the date line. So we need to uh, handle that and, uh, in order to generate a continuous mosaic. Uh, in those cases, for the Sentinel case, for example, they give you data in all the UTMs plus the two UPS. You, get, you end up with uh, more than 120 projections as, as your global mosaic uh, sources. And this is a GeoServer uh, displaying the result of uh, reprojecting everything towards uh, WGS84 and generating a seamless map. Some final words. Is this the beginning of the end? People started noticing that Web Mercator is bad. We have one actor in particular named Google that stopped using it, at least when you are zoomed out. And uh, they decided, well, what about we, if we use the globe instead? Um, I have the impression that uh, some other will follow and eventually Web Mercator will fall out of favor. That's at least my hope or dream. <laughs> so, in summary, more projections are coming in every day. There is life outside 3857. Uh, and the GeoServer with the APH helps you to support multiple projections and keep on uh, publishing global data in whatever local projection you want. Uh, you may think, uh, okay, this is making me my life more complicated. Yeah, okay, but it's also making your life and your maps more interesting and more informative. If one projection that you care about is not supported, you can add it. If you want advanced projection handling for it, um, uh, you can also add it because everything is pluggable. So in the case of the homolysin, we would have to add the projection first and then add a subsystem in the APH to add to deal with its uh, interrupted nature. Which is feasible, it's just a matter of develop developer time. And that's all. What is the performance overhead of this setting? Can you say anything about it? <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so yeah, it has an overhead, uh, but it's uh, normally enabled by default in GeoServer, and most people do not notice uh, that, the, that it's uh, working. Uh, the only part that is a bit expensive is doing the, the cutting at the uh, area of definition of a projection. That goes through JTS and it's a topologic uh, operation that's slow. The rest of it is actually pretty, pretty fast. Um, are you familiar with the adaptive composite map projections like uh, from Bernhard Jenny when uh, depending on where you navigate around the globe it will morph into a different projection? basically most useful in an interactive uh, map. So for example, if you zoom in, it would morph into a web mercator in certain areas, but on the poles it would be more st stereographic and, and so on. I think it's built into S3 ArcGIS also as an option, and, uh, but there's also open source Java-based uh, implementations for it. No, I never heard of it, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, sounds in interesting. Any other question? Yes? It's not for us. It's for oh, the I see. Okay, uh, my question is uh, the implementation of this uh, transformation and reference systems, is it related or somehow to the proj project or is it a self a standalone thing it's a standalone thing but th there is a relation so um, in the java world uh, getting in touch with native code is uh, like mating with uh, between porcupines <laughs> it's really really hard <laughs> uh, it the um, 
establishing the calls to native code uh, is a tiresome project uh, um, activity. Uh, there is a very significant overhead calling native code. And so even if the native code is fast, calling it, uh, especially if you call it very often, like many, many calls, very chatty in a relationship, it's going to kill the performance of your software. So pure Java instead. It's much faster, easier for us to maintain. However, there is a relationship. If you look at the code of the projection classes and just the projection classes, you will recognize Proj because they are ports from C to Java adapting the syntax. So if you need to do homolysis, you literally look at the layout of one of our like, supported projections and uh, replace the homolysis code in from Proj and then make it work with Java, which is normally not too far away. Uh, I, I wonder about the ideas about uh, making uh, the information which is uh, projected in many, many uh, kind of projections uh, perform very fast. Because the most common idea is just to keep the vector types, for example, in many project, uh, pro projections parallelly, in the projections we are used most. And I wonder if there are some kind of uh, improvements to this kind of uh, making a tree of a uh, few projections where we have to maintain uh, every tile, every, every kind of tile is possible. Um, okay, so if you look at the Mapbox vector tile specification, they say that uh, uh, the default is uh, web mercator, but actually the vector tile itself contains no indication of what projection it was meant for. Also, the vector tiles in, inside, they are already projected on, on the screen. So the, the, the values are not uh, in, in a, in a coordinate reference system anymore. They are already screen-based. So uh, you can actually generate vector ties for whatever projection you want. The problem is that most of the clients assume the, the layout of the web mercator, and they won't work with, with a different layout, different zoom levels, different number of root tiles, like if you have a, pro a projection, sorry, a, a grid set that has a two by one uh, root tile instead of having just one, it won't work, and so on. Uh, another thing is that Pre-populating the tile caches is not the only way to go. I think that Mapbox has pushed it a lot because technologically they, technologically they want to go to S3, stick the data in there, and then uh, work from the cheapest possible source in Amazon. But vector tiles can actually be generated on the fly, and most of the time they are, are actually faster to generate than a PNG because the PNG encoding literally kills you. Uh, performance-wise. It's like 50% of the whole response time if, if your data sources are fast enough. So I see no reason uh, not to use Mapbox vector tiles with another projection and generate them on the fly. So you can support whatever projection you want in the end. If you, if you look at the GeoServer code, it's actually a, uh, a WMS output format. You can literally ask for a vector tile doing a get map with whatever size, with whatever uh, projection. Uh, there is only one thing that a vector tile has to be square. So do you, if you ask for a 500 by 700 image, GeoServer will generate you uh, a 700 by 700 ve vector tiles with a, a side which is empty. I think we'll close. Oh. Hi. Um, what is your preferred client when not working with Mercator? Client? OK. It's time for a confession. <laughs> I don't use clients. I don't use GeoServer. I use a Java ID called IntelliJ. That's what I use 90% of my day. <laughs> So I developed GeoServer, but it's not like I actually use it. I'm most of the time stuck in an IDE trying to get new functionality or bug fixes for it. I have no idea about clients. I cannot develop in JavaScript. <laughs> so <laughs> no clue. I can tell you what my, my company went for. In Map Store, we decided not to choose. 
uh, and uh, it supports both open layers and leaflet and uh, uh, cesium. So open layers we use for anything that is OGC protocol heavy, leaflet uh, for mobile and anything that is uh, very simple and uh, cesium for whoever wants the thrill of 3D, of fake 3D, because it's just 2D maps draped on, onto a globe. Yeah. All right, we have to close it there. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we'll resume this session at noon.